In the 1950s, the US Navy carried out a major star survey, photographing the night sky to produce a database for the US military. Its primary use was to make a star chart for the new ICBM missile guidance system. But what they didn't know was it became the last look at the night sky before the space race began with the launch of Sputnik 1 in October 1957. At the time, there were no man-made objects in orbit. This turned out to be the last time to record the pristine sky that our ancestors wondered about, asking, are we alone? Today, we are still asking that question. SETI keeps searching for signs of life, but there might be a new way to search for extraterrestrials. This time, using that very same 1950s star chart and to compare it with the stars of today. This might just reveal hidden secrets by answering one question. Has anything changed? And if so, are those changes a sign of distant life? Amazingly, I can tell you today the answer is yes. This has been a really exciting film for me to make for you. If you enjoy this kind of content, please consider subscribing and give it a thumbs up. It really helps build my channel. You are about to meet two experts in the field of astronomy. Tony Mish. Tony's worked for major US telescopes and is currently archiving a historic collection for the Lick Observatory. Beatrice Villaroyal, she runs the Vasco Project. Its mission to search for interstellar anomalies by comparing the night sky of today with the night sky of the past. So I want to ask this incredibly basic question. With all these UFOs, UAPs, whatever they're called, flying around, have they ever been seen by astronomers at our observatories? So I asked Tony Mish to explain how observatories work and could they spot a UAP? Astronomers are specialists, so when they come to the telescope to make their observations, uh, they are in pursuit of a particular astrophysical problem, and the observations have to be tailored accordingly. The targets to be observed, uh, the instrument to be used, uh, the type of data to be collected are all carefully chosen and planned well in advance of the observing run. Can you take us through the normal day at an observatory? On the day of the astronomer's arrival, the observatory staff configured the telescope and the instrument and instrumentation in accordance with the observer's needs. When the actual observing begins, everyone, the observer, the uh, support staff, are all narrowly focused on the job of, uh, of observing and collecting the best possible data that can be obtained and making the most efficient use of uh, the telescope time. So do you think it might be possible that an astronomer could spot a sign of extraterrestrial life? If the observer sees the sky at all, it'll only be a tiny slice of it. And then on a television screen, um, and really just for the purpose of guiding the telescope. This narrow field of view taken together with the tight observing parameters make the chances of a serendipitous discovery unrelated to the work at hand vanishingly small. 
However, these constraints do not apply in the special case of wide field survey telescopes, uh, specifically designed to image large areas of the sky and with the aim of discovering new phenomena. These wide field survey telescopes, primarily funded to spot possible Earth colliding asteroids. By taking multiple pictures of the same night sky, they can spot objects that move. That's exactly how the Pan Stars project spotted Oumuamua. As it arrived from interstellar space and rendezvoused with our solar system. So, what other visitors are hiding in their surveys? These wide field telescopes publish all their data. The massive image archives that these surveys produce are global open source and therefore. Uh, available to any astronomer anywhere in the world with an internet connection to mine for new discoveries. So they're a great place to look for anomalies. And that's exactly what Beatrice and the Vasco project is doing. But she has added another dimension. She's comparing modern star surveys with the old star surveys from over 70 years ago. And what she has found is startling. Some stars have vanished. Others are seen today, but were not visible in the 1950s. So could whatever drives these vanishing stars be a new force of nature? Or are they evidence of distant life forms with advanced technology modifying their suns? I'm particularly fascinated by time domain astronomy. Extreme transients have a wonderful tendency of rejecting or strengthening some of our best theories. And when it comes to anomalies, well, they are very fascinating because they can really test the boundaries of what we know and we might sometimes find new physical phenomena. Already the Vasco project has found hundreds of these anomalies. For example, in the Vasco project, we found 100 short-lived transients. Now we think that most of these, or we think actually that they all, are probably natural phenomena, but we don't know what they are or what is causing these transients that we know are very short-lived and only uh, appear and disappear within a few minutes. Something else that we discovered more recently uh, is a small region of the sky where nine transients appear and disappear within half an hour. We don't know if this image that we found, that is from 1950s, is actually a real observation or if it could be some type of contamination. We still don't know and I hope that we'll find out rather soon. What else might be out there? I'm particularly fond of surveys from the 1950s. Why is it so? Well, because in the 1950s our sky was clean from any human contamination. There were no satellites and not millions of pieces of space debris as it is today. That means that the catalogs from the 1950s, the images from the 1950s, are a gold mine in order to search for alien space probes. You can help the Vasco project by comparing old and new stellar photographs, looking for differences that might just be the clue that reveals the presence of an alien civilization or a new phenomenon in our universe? We have currently 150,000 candidates of possible vanishing stars and we need your help to actually look through them. For this, we have created a website that can be found here. And it would be great if you could go to the website and help us uh, to look through some of the images at least. We live in interesting times. Not only can you now help the Vasco project search for anomalies in space. For the first time, a major government has admitted that UAPs, UFOs, whatever you want to call them, are real. They've captured them with multiple sensors, meaning they're really out there. But they also admit 
they don't know what they are. So the science community have stepped up and want to use their skills to answer that mystery. Avi Loeb's Galileo project will use specialized scientific measuring equipment to take that clear picture of a UAP that we've all been waiting for. And Tony Misch thinks that that's the best approach to solve the UAP mystery. I think the best approach to UAP, as has been suggested, is uh, a dedicated array of specially designed uh, instruments to, uh, to search and detect uh, these phenomena. And wonderfully, Beatrice is also working for the Galileo Project, and she's adding the dimension of time to solve the problem. Because maybe hidden in the past are answers for our future. By doing all this data mining, I hope that Vasco will succeed in finding a vanishing object, or maybe an object that has appeared that wasn't there 70 years ago. I think this will be extremely exciting because then we can really maybe find something that is indicative of extraterrestrials and their technology. At least I'm hoping for that. That's great. So am I, because the truth is out there. Okay, stop it there. I'm now going to tell you a secret about finding UFO information. A lot of people don't realize that your country limits your access to data. Just look at this. This is a Google search for the term UFO in the US, in Italy, in Serbia, and in France. The search results were very different. Some countries are far more open at sharing data and others are quite closed. So to get round of that issue, I use NordVPN. This is how it works. What is a VPN and how does it work? All about it in this video. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It's a tool that encrypts your internet traffic and hides your IP address and virtual location. What's a VPN used for? A virtual private network significantly boosts your online privacy and security. Thanks to its encryption, third parties cannot spy on your online activity. Even your internet service provider cannot see what you do online. A VPN also allows you to overcome internet censorship. All your traffic is routed through a remote server, so you can access websites restricted in your country. Because I like NordVPN, they're sponsoring this video, and I'm happy to recommend their service to you. So I can pass on two amazing discounts using this promo code. Firstly, 30 days free trial to see what you can find in the World Wide Web. And secondly, a massive discount. What's not to love?